So I was actually looking forward to uh, this talk more than most talks I get to give because I realized this is the first time I don't have to spend the first five minutes explaining what biochar is, which is kind of fun. <laughs> so um, let me give you a little background on the motivation for this talk and uh, the work we're doing in Haiti. Um, as uh, I was introduced with this master thesis here, um, I spent quite a bit of time working in Haiti during uh, my graduate studies um, looking for strategies to to uh, bring biochar to Haiti and, and focusing more, instead of on technology, focusing on, on, on adoption strategies and diffusion strategies of technology. Um, and the result of this was uh, essentially an action plan for biochar's adoption, um, which was executed by Carbon Roots International, this nonprofit that uh, was started two years ago with uh, some of my colleagues. And uh, so the results were an applied biochar trial in Haiti and uh, a new kind of novel, innovative uh, method of biochar diffusion, tapping into local entrepreneurship, uh, which I'll go into a little later. Um, so I'll give you a little background on Haiti to begin with. I mean, it's been in the news of the past few years. Uh, people are, are more or less familiar with, their, uh, with the country. It is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere on the standard by most in indices of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as you can see in this picture up here, about 1 to 2 percent of original tree cover remains. Uh, this is mostly due to deforestation because of fuel demand. Uh, Seventy percent of energy use in Haiti is, um, is cooking fuel, uh, which is either wood or charcoal. But you chop your trees down, you start to lose your soil, and then you find this is an issue. For the past 20 years, there's been a 0.5 to 1.2 percent decline in agriculture every year. And that adds up and creates serious food security issues and further exacerbates this 56% uh, of the country living in extreme poverty defined as less than $1.25 per day. Um, as you can see here, it's, it's, I mean, this is just a quick example of uh, farming techniques. It's very low tech. They only have hand tools, uh, small plot ownership. But because of uh, various quirks in Haitian history, Land ownership is actually equal. It's, it's fairly uh, common. Uh, many people own land, but nobody really owns much land, which is quite unique in the developing world. And then a quick theoretical framework for this uh, master's thesis research that I conducted. Um, we were using the E.M. Rogers Diffusion of Innovation Theory, which suggests that to, to have a technology successfully adopted, you need to hit a, a critical mass, a threshold of adopters, of early adopters, of innovators. And after that, you will have the rest of the, uh, the late adopters and the laggers. So you need to hit this critical mass and identify the innovators early on. Uh, this was uh, pulled into this framework with the Sustainable Livelihoods um, framework, which you can see the brief overview of it here. Um, I won't go into too much detail, nobody likes frameworks that much, but essentially it, it looks at the livelihoods, uh, whether they be, uh, sorry, the, the assets within a community, and it's a way of analyzing the economic activity and the interactions of the social, economic, and, um, and environmental kind of assets that, that are had. And most specifically, why this is important is it is concentrated on outcomes. It's not concentrated on defining it, it's concentrated on uh, beginning change and uh, you know, improving income, well-being, etc. Here's Haiti, uh, Port-au-Prince, the capital right here. That's where the earthquake hit the worst uh, two years ago. Our site is this little yellow dot here in a valley in the central plateau called La Coupe. That's the name of the region. It's only about 20 miles north of Port-au-Prince, but somehow it can take up to 10 hours to make that journey. And there's donkeys and, and hikes and everything involved. It's, it's pretty fun. <laughs> uh, the research design was uh, using participatory rural appraisal techniques, which is a way of uh, eliciting data through participation, participation of uh, local populations. In this case, I conducted about 30 interviews, individual interviews, and four focus group discussions concentrating on agricultural assets and technology adoption. Um, and then I got to spend a lot of time doing uh, statistical analysis, which was not fun at all. 
here's a brief overview of some of the agricultural asset findings to give you the context for the, uh, the farmers that we're working with in Haiti. Um, as I mentioned, land ownership is actually quite high, 75 to 80 percent. But one of the things that I'd like to point out that's very interesting is uh, nobody uses fertilizer. And in this context, I'm considering NPK and manure as fertilizer, any kind of soil amendment. In one village, 19 percent, and in the other, zero percent, which both creates a big opportunity for biochar, but also a big barrier to its adoption. You're not replacing a, a uh, technique that's already been done. You have to introduce an entirely new agricultural technique. But there is a demand for it. People here, this one interview participant said the ground was fertile, referring to you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But because of that decline in agriculture, now it's hard to grow anything. They're, they're growing less and less every year. So we also looked at management uh, of technologies and uh, how people share work and labor to consider ways of introducing, say, pyrolyzer uh, ownership. Do you want it to be collective or individual? What's the proper uh, methodology there? So there are perceptions of collective ownership in one town but not the other, but agricultural labor sharing is very common. So these, uh, you know, these are people sharing the labor of harvesting crops, of planting crops with their neighbors. And after the statistical analysis, we found that technology is not strongly correlated to land ownership, and that's because most everybody owns land. But technology ownership is correlated to irrigation access. And irrigation access, this is a, an irrigation canal here. We're talking very, you know, ditch irrigation. It's very low tech. Um, and it's correlated to ownership uh, technology adoption, or sorry, uh, to animal ownership. Um, that being said, technology ownership is dispersed, so it, chances are it's more uh, a result of a financial constraint as opposed to a social constraint. So moving right along, biochar can be considered an appropriate technology for the context of rural Haiti. There is a demand for a, a way to improve crop yields, um, but poverty should be seen because of the financial constraints as a, a significant barrier to pyrolyzer ownership. Even when we're talking about 55 gallon drum tea luds like this, that cost $15, $20 to build, that, that's cost prohibitive when you're living off $1.25 a day. So we're looking at other options besides um, individual ownership. Now, early adopter indicators, who do we want to target with these uh, with pyrolyzers right off the bat to ensure uh, early adoption? Well, wealthier people, people who can afford to take the risk of a new innovation and evidence of past agricultural innovation. So we're talking the 19 percent who do currently use manure are the most likely early adopters for this technology. And now considering a diffusion model, we need to engage these early adopters. What is the best way to actually engage these people and make sure that they do learn about biochar and get the knowledge and technology they need to make it happen? Um, and finally, the concept of epidemic diffusion of, uh, of an idea, which essentially posits that you need, you need education in these areas. One of the biggest barriers in impoverished areas to new technologies is a lack of information sharing, a lack of information about those technologies and their potential. So we need to execute a project in a high poverty context. So I've adapted um, these five criteria from uh, Margolius and Selifaski that state that to increase the uh, uh, chances of a successful project in the developing world, you need it to be impact-oriented, measurable, time-limited, specific, and that people know what to expect out of it, and practical. So here's how we intend on doing that. You know, we're impact-oriented. We want to increase crop yields. It's very, very specific, very easy, and we can share that idea. People appreciate that in rural Haiti. Measurable. We want to use a demonstration plot. We want to plant it, set a standard for what can be expected with biochar in Haiti. Uh, especially in the context of impoverished rural areas. Time limited, people can't wait forever for change. You know, you can't come there, promise something, and, and not follow through. Specific, again, people need to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And finally, practical, it needs to address real world problems that people are facing. Again, crop yields, providing no, no more food. So we did this. This is moving on from my thesis now. My thesis ended with the, uh, these recommendations. Now Carbon Roots comes in and we actually try and implement everything that was part of that action plan. So we built a demonstration plot uh, using 
converting biomass, this is all agricultural, um, agricultural waste in, in rural Haiti. So you can see palm fronds, um, corn, uh, beans, rice. We do not use wood in Haiti because, again, they have 1% to 2% forest left. We make it an organizational rule to never use hardwood. Um, we had 16 plots, four control, four biochar, four compost, four biochar and compost. Um, and it was all executed with collaboration from the United Kingdom uh, Biochar Research Center and Abby Clare there, who is integral in helping us put this together. We planted corns and beans. Here's an aerial view of the plot. Uh, and it was randomly distributed, set up uh, in land that hadn't otherwise been used by people there. And we got our first results just uh, three weeks ago. I got to measure it. And it was really interesting. So we, we saw a 29% increase in yield and just bean yield from biochar use, which interestingly enough, and we're still tossing around ideas as why this might be, uh, biochar and compost together was only 15% increase in yields, which, I mean, this is just the first planting season. This is the first data set. We're, we're curious about that. I'm going back down very soon to plant the next one, and see what happens. But we also saw at that point that there is independent adoption of biochar by four community members. This was beyond our distribution of information. These are people who independently adopted biochar because of what they saw on the demonstration plot within this community, which those are the early adopters. That's the 2.5% of early adopters who are most likely the opinion leaders and the people we need to target here on out in the future for the further diffusion of biochar technology. Um, so like I said, I'll be going down uh, next week, actually, I go back to Haiti to harvest the corn. Unfortunately, when I was there last time, we found out that a cow broke in and ate a lot of the crop, so our data is going to be a little off, but that's, that's the fun of working in a place like Haiti. Um, but the next step, working with these entrepreneurs, and we've been developing a new context for the diffusion of this technology assuming that people will not be buying pyrolyzers. You can't expect every family there to own a pyrolyzer, given the context of the poverty in rural Haiti. So we'd like to empower these uh, opinion leaders, these, these early adopters, these entrepreneurs, to become what we're calling mo mobile biochar service providers um, in facilitating the creation of small enterprise within these rural areas providing them with the training and some 55-gallon drums, the, you know, the simplest technology to make biochar out there that's quite mobile, um, and have them go from farm to farm and essentially charge a small fee to convert the, uh, the agricultural waste on those lands into biochar and aid the, uh, the small plot farmers in these areas to, to use biochar, essentially. So this is... This is the model that we're testing next, and we're going to start executing this this coming fall after we uh, finalize the, these corn harvests, which will be interesting after the cow ate them. So that's, that's it. That's the next step, and we're really looking forward to doing that. And I have one more quick slide here just to make a comment that there are a lot of diverse biochar projects going on in the developing world, what is called the first tier, the bottom of this pyramid, the small-scale developing world. And there are a lot of lessons that can be learned there that different organizations are, are learning. People are making the same mistakes over and over again, unfortunately, within the context of these high poverty areas. So we have just uh, begun a, an alliance for these bottom tier um, projects with, uh, in, in collaboration with the biochar company and two other projects that um, are working within the, the developing world. And uh, we are very excited about the potential of this to share, share ideas, share, um, share functions, share back-end uh, requirements of running these small projects. So yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you all very much for, for your attention.